crime and passion. As Richard drove down the winding country road, he still had the memories of the tragedy that befell his former family plaguing his mind. His wife Emily had asked for a divorce, and it was now two days after it had been finalized. They had been married for eight years before the tragic accident that killed their only child, Marion. They had been on a skiing holiday in the high country and Marion was in the playgroup that was in a little hamlet in the picturesque little holiday village called Asclerites. He would never forget the impact of that day. Of this he was certain, for it had been scribed deep into the recesses of his shattered mind. He had got back in the afternoon to find the resort in a state of chaos for there had been an accident when an avalanche had engulfed half of the village and with it had been the play school where 14 children had died. The story of the tragedy had been all over the news. His wife and many others had had precognitive dreams for telling the incident, or so it was reported after the tragic event. On the other hand, everyone knew that the village was in the danger zone, however, it was worth the risk, you might hear them say before the accident, although they were forever silenced when the tragedy hit their picturesque little village that fateful afternoon. The holiday companies and the profiteers all grouped together after the tragedy and rebuilt the town, adding a scenic memorial spa, which was built like the ancients of old used to bathe in. Only this one was for show only. Set between two marble columns that stood together, and at its end was a plaque that was made of copper with their names inscribed and rest in peace at its heading. However, although the village got over the tragic blow of the deaths and the avalanche, and was totally restored to its former glory, it turned out to be a flop rather than a success. The holiday companies could not give the tickets away even when they tried. It was suggested that because the town was rebuilt with guilt and blood and not sweat and toil like the original, it could only be seen as an unholy shrine. The only people to have visited it after the tragedy were the counterculture socialites, and even they did not last the full night. When they fled they spread strange and mysterious rumors of things that bumped in the darkest hours of the seemingly endless night. So, the once high-risk and high-priced village that was set at the foot of an ice kingdom and paradise that was once the place to be for the high and mighty and the social elite had become a ghost town because of the tragedy. Richard had been to the village many times, and he had caught glimpses of those poor lost souls in the corner of his eyes, and although it was a glimpse for when he turned to focus they were gone. The vision was accompanied by emotional feelings and another strange sense that one had glimpsed into the past, or some kind of child purgatory. Sometimes he would experience the children playing merrily as only children know how and at other times he heard their cries and felt their fear and suffering, but he never left until dawn for he was impervious to the dark because of his love for his lost daughter. Then, there was the time that he fell asleep and he dreamt that he saw his daughter, and she had told him that all that remained in that village was echoes, and that he must let it go and move on for the children were safe and in the light. She told him that he had seen the children at play, when they had visited their old homes from spirit, and that was when they were merry and bright. However, the other time when it was pain and terror, these were not the lost souls of the children, but an ethereal imprint left by the tragedy that was now becoming a dark force. She said that in its near future, it was destined to be used by the black witches and evil cults as a place of evil worship and practice. The children will be seen as a sacrifice, and they will hold initiation ceremonies as they perform to their dark gods, and with that in mind they will stir up evil and they will become a force to be reckoned with. She said that the only safe haven from their evil influences would be to stay as far away as possible from their dark lair. She told him that his future was her salvation and that he must use his love for her to begin a new life, for it was when he was settled that she could truly rest and spiritually move on. Finally, she stated with genuine authority that they would meet several times again before and after his death, 
and she had constantly fulfilled the first part of her promise time, and time again. When Richard and Emily booked the holiday, they were caught by its glamour and glitz and they did not recognize its dangers like they did not recognize the price. Seven months after the tragedy his wife was still torn to ribbons and was in and out of the finest asylums that money could buy. Eventually, they terminated their marriage so she could begin again and try to put the past behind her. Richard agreed for he wanted the best for all and there was no way that their marriage could heal so he went along with the divorce, split their wealth and had bought himself a little hideaway deep into the country to get over it. Richard, although an heir of a wealthy well-to-do family had never been successful in love, he had been through an endless string of fruitless relationships where he ended up marrying Emily because she had fallen pregnant with their lovely daughter Marion who they both loved so dear. Emily could not complain, for Richard was a wealthy eligible bachelor, and was considered by many women to be quite a catch. Although she knew that Richard's love was already taken, and she knew that they met regularly in their special place, where they felt that they would be alone, in Richard's dreams. She had felt the passion, and she had heard his calls for Anne. And she knew that Richard and she could never aspire to that kind of love. Oh, when he calls and calls and she does not arrive, he sounded like a banshee, tormented and twisted and screeching in the dead of the night. At first, she had thought that he had a lover, and that it was his unconscious confession sent to torment her very being while he slept, however, she knew that the love that she and Richard shared could not hold back the kind of passion that they shared if they were together and alone in the flesh. Nothing on earth could hold back that kind of love, God would not permit it, so, if they were together outside of his dreams, he would have left her by now. She did wonder though, however, when the shoestring detectives came out negative, she paid a visit to the local library and acquired some books on dreams and the unconscious, and then she did some detective work of her own. She worked out that it was some kind of dream episode created out of his repressed genetic drives secretly propagating with the aid of wish fulfillment accompanied by his bodily needs and functions while he slept. But she knew that that was phony too, for she knew from her experience when she had laid there awake, empty and suffering in those long dark twisted vacuumed hours that their love had more depth than that. At first she would lay there listening and then, after a time, she began probing his mind with questions of who am I? What is my name? Where did we meet and where is our favorite spot? She would whip up her courage and ask him to tell her that he loved her, prove to her that he cared. Oh, how she wept when he would answer positive to the latter, oh, how she longed to be Anne. After a time, she wondered why it was that they met in that same place and why it was always Anne. If in the real world that she did not exist, and she had thought that perhaps she was a personification of his passion that he keeps locked away after he has made his way home from the midnight hours to the twilight state. She was a figment of his imagination, conjured up from his past romances, all rolled up into one ideal form, that he secretly longed to commit to, but never found the courage. Anne was an echo of his nostalgic sirens that had tried to lure his ship onto the rocks in the cruel sea from his past. Yes, in his waking world they were not one, they were legion, his best kept secrets, so secret that he still keeps it locked away even to this day. She knew all too well of Richard's shallow and amorous past, and she felt his fear of commitment was to keep himself from being hurt. She knew that he had some deep-seated issues from their own love life, because it was automated and remote, and she supposed that his passionate dreams with his dream girl was just another way in which his issues were coming through into his consciousness. She concluded, hell. At least he is not out on the tiles seeing a real lover in the flesh, or a hooker, and up to God knows what. With the bonding of their child their own love had begun to grow and although it was love, it was not the love that comes with the true love that he shared with her in the heat of his dreams.
However, they were happy and they were both involved in travel, hobbies and social groups, and with the passing of time came the story of his mother, who had died giving birth to him and had left his father alone with his only child. His father had hated the sight of him and had married again, so he could rid himself of the burden and at the same time have more children from new stock. After a strict beginning. 1. Because of his father's hate, that his son's birth had robbed him of his beloved wife. And 2. That his new stepmother loathed him, because he bore resemblance to his late mother of which she knew only too well was her husband's one true love of which she was just a replacement. He had been relieved from all this turmoil, and was probably the only happy boy at his boarding school from his primary on to his final years, where he was to aspire academically, as well as in art and literature. With this kind of tragedy, she had finally come to terms with why he found it difficult to show his love and that was because, love to Richard was a stranger that he had never seen or met. So, it was no surprise when that tragic day had robbed them of their precious daughter that soon after that that if they did not have another, that their love would become exposed for what it truly was, fruitless, superficial and void. As Richard neared the drive, a cold shiver ran up his spine and he thought it was a ghost, a memory of his past that had come back to haunt him, or perhaps it was his sense of closure homing in. His eyes filled with tears and his body shook with anguish as he was swept through the full impact of his loss once again. He parked his car in the drive, then got out and took his keys from his pocket and unlocked his door to his new abode. Although it was dilapidated it was livable and he had got it on the cheap, he thought that he would fix it up and that it would take him to that place in his dreams. When he had seen it on that Ghostbuster series, he could hardly contain himself, he recognized it at once. It was the meeting place where he and Anne had met time after time in his dreams. It looked shabby he knew, but he would repair it and take it back to how it was when Anne and he had sat and talked in his conservatory. Of course, he knew it was a coincidence and that by chance he had seen it on daytime television in the psychiatric waiting room when he had gone to visit his troubled ex-wife. That night his daughter had visited him again in his dreams and she mouthed the name of the house and road in which it was set and the dream was so vivid and had such a deep impact that when he awoke he immediately wrote it down. He saw it as some kind of sign from his daughter in spirit that he could use the house as a vocation and a new life, especially if he restored the conservatory. On the program, they stated that they could not sell it and that it was on the market at a very low price. It followed with, if you purchase this house, be aware of the curse that plagues its past and make sure that you stay asleep all through the night. Richard rang the television station, who at first put him on hold and then came back to him with an address and telephone number of the correct estate agent in the village that was near to it and dealing with the house. He had quit his job at the office and sold his businesses and decided to spend all his time on his hobby, which was writing his novel on Anne. It was called, Conversations with Anne. At the back of the house there were the remnants of a conservatory that was identical to the one in his dreams and he envisioned himself in his future sitting there in a long cool autumn evening, sipping on a cool beer focusing and then writing his masterpiece. Three months passed and it was in the early evening that he first set his eyes on Anne. She wore a beautiful long white flowing dress, just as she always did and she had the face of an angel just as she always had and there was not one blemish on her perfectly symmetrical face. Her hair was golden like the sun, and he was sure that it glowed. She was about 5 feet 10 in height, and of medium build, and he was awestruck by her natural beauty. It was as if his life had finally fallen into sync, and that all the past unfulfilling relationships and personal tragedies suddenly made sense. It was as if he had been waiting to see her in the flesh and fall instantly in love with her all his life. 
She walked up to him and it seemed that she did not have a care in the world when she said in a soft feminine voice, Hello, my name is Anne. What is your name? He wanted to ask her if she remembered what they shared in his dreams. Then he thought he best wait for the opportune moment in case he scared her off by thinking that he was a player making a move or a psychopath on the scent, so he kept silent. He introduced himself and then asked, My name is Richard. Do you live around here, Anne? Hear about Richard, she replied and a look of confusion was portrayed upon her face. He was not put off by her aloof behavior and he thought to himself that perhaps she was married and that she had just come around out of curiosity. After all, he had been in his new retreat for three months, and he had not seen hind or hair of any of the folks from the scattered hamlets nearby, or anyone from the small village that was approximately three miles up the road. He drove 30 miles up to Yokehampton to get his shopping and pick up building materials, and that being a major city no one knew anyone, and that was just the way he wanted it. So he kept himself to himself unless the impossible happened, and then in walked her. Had he somehow seen into the future? How could this be possible? Could it be true? For a minute he wondered if he had drifted off to sleep, and that he was still at the wheel of his car. He wanted so badly to scream out, It is I my love, we have found each other in the flesh at long last. He looked silently down to her marriage finger to spy if she had a ring, and she did not and a smile lit up his face as he asked, Would you like a drink, Anne? She turned down his offer of the drink, and she asked him his occupation, of which he exclaimed that he was a budding writer. She was amused and there was a spark in her eyes when she said, Oh, do you know any stories or poems that we could share? So, he told her his dreams, although he changed his and her name to Melissa and Jim. He hoped that she would remember, but she did not, so he thought he would be patient and see if the future would unveil the mystery of their chance encounter and their potential love. The house was all but done on the outside now, although the conservatory was set in front of two beautiful French windows, the wood was rotten so they could not sit in his favorite spot of his future. Time seemed to stand still as he told her yarn after yarn, and it was early morning when she stated that she must get back. Did you want to stay for breakfast first? He asked. Thank you, but no thank you, was her reply and off she went as mysteriously as she had arrived. She left him yearning for her love, and he sat there sipping his drink while listening to the dawn chorus. After their first encounter, she paid him a visit every night for two months without fail, and although they got on like two lovers from a fairy tale, they had never kissed, or even touched. Oh, how he longed for that kiss and that warm embrace of his dreams. She had just come and sat with him all night, until the early hours of the following day, and they shared romantic poetry from his love story. She was full of fun and laughter, however, she had her barriers up and they had still never touched. He projected onto her that she did not want to get too close, Perhaps she did not want to be hurt, or let down, and she reminded him of himself from his past. As time went by, he found himself falling even deeper, and totally in love with Anne and he knew that she felt the same way. She was young and beautiful and of childbearing age, and he often consciously dreamt of their long and bright future together. He felt that it was not precognition for although it was Anne, and there would be house, they did not dance and kiss and make endless love like they did in his dreams. He hypothesized that they were soulmates that had made a pact from within eternity, a pact that they would somehow meet and self-actualize their infinite love, and that love would stretch from here and then back into eternity. Another three months had passed and it was then that he decided to ask her again where she lived. She seemed puzzled by his question, and seemed to lose her glow. 
He panicked at her change in mood and he was terrified that he might lose the harmony that they had found together. He thought to himself that he did not care where she was from or if she did not remember their adventures in his dreams. She was an angel and he did not want to lose her to his selfish wants and desires. Things were perfect just the way they were and if anyway, her mysterious entrance and departure acted like that of a muse for he found himself inspired by her presence and his head was ever filled with endless stories and countless poems of devout love. It was like the mystery had manifested from his subconscious mind from his past into their present and very real world. His dreams had stopped on the night of their first meeting, yes, it was now that she inspired him to write poetry and short stories during the afternoon so that each night he could read them to her in the flesh. They would joke around like children as they played, sang and shared his stories deep into the night. No. He could not lose her love again. It would be just like in the past when he awoke only to see it was all a dream. Only this time it would be worse for he would know that she was real and alive and that it was his stupidity that had scared her off like a cross to a vampire. So he changed the subject and miraculously her mood changed back to how it previously was. He thought that she could be the sufferer of amnesia. Or perhaps she had conscious barriers that she had on purposely placed there like he had hitherto thought. So he decided that he would be patient and not venture down that path again until she was ready to reveal herself to him when her time was right. He eventually finished both the inside and outside of the house and one early evening when he had lost all sense of time he found himself working on his conservatory which he had purposely saved until last when he was surprised by Anne's visit. She was standing behind him and he did not see or even hear her arrive. His mind, he thought, was elsewhere when he was ripping up the rotten timber that was once the conservatory floor. He was startled and he said that he would stop and continue tomorrow when it was light and she told him to carry on for she was as excited as he that he had started working on his future study. He carried on ripping up the wood and she sat at the side on the grass keeping him company while he feverishly worked. It was then that he noticed, below the rotten floorboards, just under the sand, what appeared to be a coffin. He excitedly remarked on his finding to Anne, for he thought that she would be as excited as he at the mystery. It was then that he saw her reeling in what appeared to be absolute horror and agony on the grass. He ran over to her, forgetting the mysterious coffin, and he cradled her in his arms as she wriggled and screamed out, help me, someone, please. She went through a series of convulsions and the torment and horror that he felt all over at watching her twisted body go through all that pain as she spasmodically jerked twitched and gasped for air, and it was insurmountable and nondescript. He cradled her in his arms and he spoke words of comfort over her, trying to ease the pain and the suffering. Although it was Anne, at the same time he was aware that he could feel the presence of his daughter Marion, and he felt as if he had somehow been projected back in time, and was there comforting her in his warm arms when the tragedy had struck. It is all right my darling. I am here with you, you are not alone. It's okay, everything is going to be all right my love. Eventually she stopped wriggling and serenity washed over her countenance, and she looked up and seemed to reach deep into his very soul when she asked in Marion's voice, Daddy, is that you? He replied, Yes, my love, Daddy's here. You are not alone my little darling. Then. Her face lit up like that of an angel and it was in peace that she eventually died. As she died he found himself once again looking down on Anne, and that inner essence that was Marion was no longer there. He then saw his daughter standing to the left next to an old oak tree, and a light seemed to emanate from her very being, and she had the most beautiful smile along with that overwhelming sense of inner peace and bliss. 
There was a man that stood next to her, and Richard knew that he had made his presence known to exemplify that Marion was in safe hands. The man was obviously from a different time period, for he was dressed in the attire that the gentry used to wear in the last century. He stood there bold and bright, and as he smiled and sent warmth, that filled Richard's soul with an ethereal energy that seemed to build up behind him. As the energy began to take shape it formed into a Mandela-type hallway. However, Richard had a strange sense of inner knowing that it was a conduit to another dimension, and he could feel deep inside, even though it defied all logic and reasoning, that he at some time had used that port frequently in his past. The remaining energy had become four angels, the angels had no wings and they did not appear like the contemporary, or the classical artists had portrayed them. They were tall and humanoid at the first glance, with unblemished skin, perfect bone structure, and every muscle and every feature was totally symmetrical in every way. Although they appeared to be of the physical world, like some kind of elite humanoid species constructed in a lab, or the next stage of evolution, there was no mistaking that they were not of this world, and that they were beyond the creativity of Mother Nature. They were created out of ethereal energy, and the only way to be both pedantic and specific is to state that they were living light beings in their ethereal flesh. Two of them came over and they stood next to Richard, and they were so close that if he did not feel, in what can only be described as a dizzy and slightly drunk mental state, he was sure that he would have reached out and touched them just to see if he could feel what he could see. The two angels that had remained at the foot of the tunnel took hold of his daughter and the man by their hands, and then they pleasantly drifted off toward the light that was at the end of the tunnel. Then, Anne's body broke free as she passed through his arms and he could feel that she was no longer earthbound or confused. The angels took hold of her outstretched arms and they drifted down the tunnel into love, peace and bliss and Richard knelt there, bent over forward and cradled his upper torso as he wept relentlessly until sunrise. That night brought about many changes in Richard's life and the following morning as he watched the sunrise still in the same spot and position as he was before. He reflected on his divorce that was brought about by the tragic death of his daughter, and for the first time his eyes became dry, but not from the lack of tears, he had found inner peace. He still loved his daughter and he knew that she lived on in spirit, and that Anne had gone with her, and that they both wanted him to recover from his loss and move on. The next day, when he called the authorities and they opened up the coffin, inside was a female skeleton of a woman, who was dressed in what was once a long flowing white wedding dress. The dress was splattered in dried blood, and had patches stained in deep rust, and crimson around the chest, knees and feet. Above where the woman would have laid in her coffin, on the underside of the lid, there was dried blood and embedded tips of broken fingernails and fragments of bone embedded within the scratches, and dried rotten flesh, and it was obvious that she had been buried alive from the offset. The police did their research, and after a few months, or so the crime was claimed to be solved. Apparently, sometime in the early last century a husband and wife had lived in the house and their names were Frank, Anne and Collins. Frank, who was a local, respected and powerful judge, and nobleman was 33 years older than his young wife, who was also the daughter of a nobleman, and it was said that their marriage was barren of love and was a marriage of wealth and stature. He had said that his wife had secretly run off with the caretaker gardener, and they were never seen again. No one suspected foul play for the judge, was also a solid citizen on top of his power and respect. She had left her wedding ring with her goodbye note and that was that, and off they had run like lovers often do. Everyone knew of the young lover's love for it was so talked about by both him and the village, that it had aspired from gossip to folklore. It was also romanticized and suggested that they had not told a soul of their whereabouts to avoid detection from Anne's husband, work associates and his henchmen. It was said that Richard was a budding writer and a poet, and they were both 25, 
young and in love and no one questioned their disappearance or why they had run away together. Frank had married again to Sally Bowler. She was originally second on his wife-to-be list. Eventually, Frank died of pneumonia, embraced within his broken-spirited wife's arms at the age of 94. Sally died three years later, and they were both buried together in the churchyard in the local village. When he had looked them up in the town's archives, he had found pictures, and although Sally was much older she had the same distinctive features of Emily, his ex-wife, it could be a relative, but when he searched, her family line died with her as she was an only child and had no children. The house it was said had been left to fall apart, and not even looted in fear of the dark spirits that walked through the night, it was said that one could feel the negativity and horror even by day, and even the animals kept well away. Eventually, it was gathered up by a local real estate agent, who had been sold it by the government where it had been handed over, because it had become an eyesore in the local community. Although the house was in a beautiful location, hence the complaints, it was never sold for the paranormal activity had been televised by a national television company. The medium which they had brought on location had passed out, and when he regained his consciousness he said that that place must be left to God. It is pure evil. So there it lay falling apart as the natural elements took its toll. Eventually it had been sold to Richard at an exceedingly low price. Richard was well aware of the superstition that surrounded it, but he felt drawn to it, like it was his destiny, for it was identical to the house that he and Anne had sat and talked in his dreams. The police searched the estate and eventually they found the bones of what they took to be the missing caretaker gardener, Richard, in an unused and dried up well in an overgrown and run-down part of the garden. His skull had been fractured through what appeared to be a fatal gunshot wound to his head. Richard wrote his second book, after conversations with Anne, that was based on the evidence from the library, the internet, popular tales, local gossip and myths. It became and was seen as a romantic tragedy, and it made its mark. The story was given depth, because of what Richard had found when replacing the loose floorboards in the penthouse bedroom on the third flight. Underneath the boards he found a tin box, and inside was the diaries of the judge's second wife. In the last three years after the judge's death, the diaries were more of a confession to God, pleading for his forgiveness than anything else. She asked God to please help her, for she was sure to be hell bound, for she knew of a crime, but was kept in silence because of an oath that she had made with her beloved husband. Her husband had confided in her telling her a secret to hold, but not to tell, and so she had kept her promise, and she had not told a soul. She wrote on, I realize that to take life and destroy love are the greatest sins to you dear God, but I was held by love and fear. My husband confessed that he had murdered the lover along with his ex-wife, because they had changed people's opinion of him, and that he had become a laughing stock among the commoners that work in the village. So, in a fit of rage, he had savagely brutalized and then shot the caretaker, and buried his wife alive under the conservatory. God please take mercy on me, please, I beg of you, please. It was the impact of the diaries that had fueled Richards's enthusiasm to write the second book. He did it not for love of money, for he could live not only sensibly, but comfortably on the money that he had made selling his first book, Conversations with Anne, and along with his inheritance, it was because he wanted the world to share and somehow send out their love and empathy to those poor old souls that had suffered for so long. Two years passed by in a flick of an eye and Richard was attending a night school where he was studying drama and script writing at a college in Yokehampton. He saw the class as another vocation, a way into which to gain inspiration and script writing techniques. In the class, they had been asked to pick a partner of the opposite sex, they had to play the roles of husband and wife and were to write a short romantic comedy script together. 
Outside as Richard was making his way back to his car. Mary a fellow student, who he had picked as his writing partner, because she reminded him of the photo that he had of his natural mother, had come up to him and asked if he would like to go for a drink down the local pub so as they could work together on their scripts outside of class for the next lesson. He said he would, and it was then that as he was walking with her up the road that he saw in the distance what looked like Anne. He forgot about Mary and ran after Anne as fast as his feet could muster. She had reached a street corner when she suddenly stopped and she turned her head around and even though she had the same build and beautiful long golden flowing hair, and was even wearing the same beautiful untarnished dress, when she turned to look at him she had no face as such. Her face, or where her face should have been was devoid of all features, there was no nose, mouth, eyes or even ears. He had nearly reached her, and he was about ten yards behind her when he suddenly became motionless, as if he had somehow had a spell cast upon him, he was riveted to the spot at seeing her featureless countenance faced in his direction. Even though her face was featureless it did however have her shape, and it had a strange and beautiful ethereal glow emanating from it that somehow radiated love, compassion and wisdom amongst all the confusion. Then, she turned back to face the original direction of which she had been traveling, and then she turned the corner and as she did, it broke the spell that bound him and he began to run after her once more. He shouted her name as loud as his lungs and voice could bellow, and then as he turned the corner, at which she had just turned, stumbling and shaking with disbelief and ecstasy she was nowhere to be seen, just an empty street and his longing empty heart.